Coming to the obstetric part of this video lecture, we talk about cervical length and ISWOG practice guidelines explaining the role of ultrasound and prediction of spontaneous preterm birth are a good place to start with if you want to understand how we can use ultrasound effectively in screening and prevention of preterm birth in singleton pregnancies. Now, as has been determined by the Fetal Medicine Foundation UK, there are a certain uh, set of criteria that need to be satisfied in order to obtain an optimal image to measure the cervical length during pregnancy. First, the patient has to be placed in the dorsal lithotomy position with an empty bladder because transvaginal ultrasound is the way to go. Transabdominal sonography doesn't have the resolution to measure the cervix accurately and it is not recommended for assessment of cervical length during pregnancy. One should use a vaginal probe with a frequency of more than 5 megahertz, which is usually the case in any basic machine, and it should be covered with a disposable lubricated sheet. Then this probe is placed in the anterior vaginal fornix to obtain a longitudinal or a sagittal view of the cervix. Of course, the image, as usual, has to be magnified so that it occupies 75% or more of the screen. And the structures that we need to look for in order to identify the cervix include the internal os, the external os, the endocervical canal, the endocervical mucosa. And it's important to identify these structures so that we are sure that we are actually assessing the cervix and not including the lower uterine segment, which might contract and give us an impression of being a part of the cervix and give a falsely increased cervical length. Also, while assessing the cervical length, one should avoid excessive pressure on the cervical lips with the transducer because this can cause overestimation of the cervical length. And what is usually recommended is that once you push the probe in uh, into the anterior vaginal fornix, you withdraw it a little bit because uh, even if you uh, try not to exert too much pressure, you initially do go in with a little pressure and to ease the pressure, you just withdraw the probe a little bit ensuring that the anterior and posterior lips of the cervix are of equal thickness. If you exert undue pressure on the cervix with your transvaginal probe, usually the anterior lip would be pressed more and you can appreciate that the pressure is too much if the anteroposterior thickness of the anterior lip is not equal to that of the posterior lip. Also, it is a good practice to take time to measure the cervical length. In fact, it's recommended that one should wait for at least three to five minutes while measuring the cervical length and take at least three measurements and use the shortest measurement as the close cervical length. This is important because please remember that the internal loss is a dynamic structure and sometimes at the start of the examination, the internal loss might seem close to you, but if you continue monitoring the cervix for say three to five minutes and even if you try and exert some amount of fundal pressure with your free left hand, say for around 15 to 20 seconds, you might actually observe the opening or funneling of the internal os. So it's a good practice to take at least three measurements and then use the shortest measurement as the cervical length. Now this is an illustration to show you how we measure the cervical length. There are cases where you sometimes see some kind of funneling happening in the upper part of the cervix and what is recommended while estimating the cervical length is to include only this closed cervical length. So you first identify the external os. This is the anterior lip. This is the posterior lip of the cervix. Note that the anterior and posterior lips are equal in thickness. This means that we are not exerting undue pressure on the cervix with our transducer. And then we follow the endocervical canal by identifying the hypoechoic fibromuscular stroma around the endocervical mucosa to reach at the level of the internal os. And then this distance from the internal to the external os is measured as the cervical length. Uh, earlier, people used to uh, measure the length of the funnel or width of the funnel, but now studies have shown that funnel uh, measuring the funnel or estimation of the funnel length or the funnel size doesn't really add much in terms of predicting the risk of spontaneous preterm birth. And it is just the cervical length that we need to measure and take into account. This is another uh, illustration just to show you 
again, how to measure the cervical length if there is a cerclage in place. So these two black dots represent a cerclage or a cervical stitch. And what we need to measure even when there is a cerclage in situ is the total closed cervical length. So if there is again a funnel say at the top, so what we measure is from the bottom of the funnel till the external loss. And it is this total cervical, closed cervical length that is measured. There is uh, uh, no role of measuring a part of the cervix, say above or below the cerclage. In case you're having difficulty in measuring the entire cervix because of some shadowing from the cerclage, you can use this technique and add up these two measurements to give you the total closed cervical length. So it's basically the total closed cervical length which is used for management of the patient. Now this is one example taken from the same ISWO guidelines to show you how we uh, look at the cervix and how we identify the various parts of the cervix during pregnancy. So this is a sagittal section of the cervix taken, as you can see, with a transvaginal probe with a nearly empty bladder. So there is just minimal amount of urine in the urinary bladder. We've taken a sagittal section. The probe is in the vagina. And first, we will identify the external loss. So this is the external loss. This is the probe orientation dot. So this is the anterior. And this would be the anterior lip of the cervix. This is the posterior lip. So the pressure should be such that the thickness of the anterior lip is equal to that of the posterior lip, which is the case. There is optimal magnification. The image is occupying more than 75% of the screen. Now, have you identified the external os here? So this is the anterior lip. This is the posterior lip. So this would be the external os. Now, what you see here, this anechoic content is nothing but mucus in the cervical canal. Please don't mistake it for bulging of membranes in the cervical canal. Please note that this is the endocervical mucosa, this thin echogenic line that you see, and this hypoechoic band that you see outer to it is nothing but the fibromuscular stroma. So we just trace this endocervical mucosa and fibromuscular stroma, and where they end at this level would be the internal os. So we can see clearly that the internal os is closed in this image. So this is the appearance of a normal cervix. So in order to measure the cervical length, we would draw a straight line from the internal to the external os, and this would give us the total cervical length. In some instances, the cervix is not straight like this. It may be curved. So if it is curved, one can always take two or three straight measurements and add them up, just how we measure the uterus when it is anti-verted or retroverted. So if we want to measure the uterine length, we take two or three measurements with a straight line and add them up. Similarly, we can do if the cervix appears to be curved. In fact, it is believed that even on eyeballing, if you see that the cervix is curved during the mid-trimester scan, it's most likely that the cervical length would be normal. So if you see a straight cervix, that is the cervix which would have a higher chance of being shot, that is uh, 25 millimeters or less. Now, this is another uh, example, again, taken from the SWOG guidelines to show you that you should not confuse this appearance of the cervical canal as bulging of membranes into the cervical canal. As you can appreciate here, first, let's just analyze the image. It's a transvaginal image of the sagittal section of the uterus. We have the anterior and the posterior lips here. Note, the cervix was straight here. Here, the cervical canal is curved. So if I want to take measurements, I can draw a straight line from here to here and then a straight line from here to here and add these two measurements to get the total cervical length. Why I say that the cervix is closed is because I identify this thin flimsy, this echogenic thin flimsy line that you see here is the amniotic membrane. And you can see that the amniotic membranes are not bulging into the cervical canal. What this stuff that you see, the anechoic stuff with some echogenic areas, Within the endocervical canal is nothing but the cervical mucus. And you should not mistake this to be an incompetent cervix. Especially if you're seeing it real time, you will be able to clearly see these membranes separate from the mucus in the cervical canal. So this is again a normal cervix and not incompetent. Now this is what the image of an incompetent cervix looks like. One look, you see this longitudinal section of the cervix. Cervix is straight. It is clearly short. Even if you don't measure, you know it would be less than 2.5 centimeters. And you can see these membranes are bulging. The internal loss is open and the membranes are bulging into the cervical canal, giving a V-shaped kind of appearance here. 
This is again the image of the same patient taken a few uh, a minute or two later and you can see how now the extent of bulging of the membranes into the cervical canal has increased. So this is the importance of evaluating the cervix real time, that is dynamic evaluation of the cervix for three to five minutes when you are trying to look for the cervical length, taking three measurements and then using the shortest as the cervical length. Now here you can clearly see this is the amniotic membrane. So this is not the amniotic fluid, this is just the mucus in the cervical canal, whereas the amniotic membrane ends here. And you can see this amniotic fluid with some echogenic debris uh, within the contained by these amniotic membranes. So this is a clear cut image of cervical incompetence. Now, initially the internal loss had a V-shaped configuration and within a minute or two, it has assumed a more marked U-shaped configuration with further shortening of the cervix. So what is recommended is that in singleton pregnancies, the cervical length screening should be done at the time of the mid-trimester scan between 18 to 24 weeks while you're doing the routine anomaly scan. And why this is done is that because uh, it's not worthwhile to measure the cervical length in the first trimester. A, because you don't start management in the first trimester. Uh, the guidelines don't recommend administration of vaginal progesterone in the first trimester itself. It's recommended in the early second trimester. And also the assessment of cervical length in the first trimester is not very accurate by ultrasound because the lowest uterine segment is not well developed at that point of time. And we end up overestimating the cervical length when we are measuring it in the first trimester. So if you are screening a person, a lady, say a primary parous lady, who has obviously no history of previous preterm birth, and you're doing an anomaly scan between 18 to 24 weeks, you can assess the cervical length at that time by doing a transvaginal ultrasound with an empty bladder. And if you get a cervical length of 25 millimeters or less, then it is termed as a short cervix. And these are the patients in which some kind of intervention would be done, uh, even if they are asymptomatic for it. Uh, you, why this upper limit of gestational age for cervical screening is 24 weeks is because uh, this 24 weeks is considered as the deadline for you know, taking any preventive measures in the form of vaginal progesterone or placement of a circlage. So beyond 24 weeks, usually today the pediatric and uh, NICU care is so good that rather than trying to go for these preventive measures, which may not be very helpful, one tends to tilt uh, in favor of therapeutic measures in terms of administration of corticosteroids using magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection and tocolysis. So beyond 24 weeks, the preventive role of progesterone and circlage is not there. So there is no point in screening for cervical length after 24 weeks. Also, measurement of cervical length in the pre-pregnancy period, say for instance in a woman who's undergone multiple mid-trimester abortions, is not useful for predicting preterm birth in a subsequent pregnancy. So pre-pregnancy measurement of the cervix has no value whatsoever in predicting preterm birth in a future pregnancy. So the main objective when we are screening a low risk, say a primary parous woman for cervical length is to select those patients who have a short cervix and who have a high risk of preterm birth so that we can initiate preventive measures in a timely manner. And what those preventive measures are that as soon as we detect a cervix of say 25 millimeters or less, what is started is vaginal progesterone and discontinued till 36 weeks of gestation. Also, there is a tendency to put the patient on bed rest and various studies have shown that it is not useful. In fact, it ends up increasing thromboembolic events in women and restriction of baseline physical activity, that is activities of day-to-day -day living, is not recommended in women uh, who, are, uh, like, who haven't had a previous history of preterm, who are asymptomatic but end up having a short cervix at the mid-trimester scan. So in asymptomatic women, the restriction of baseline physical activity is not recommended if you just see a short cervix in the mid-trimester scan. What is the role of cervical circlage in singleton pregnancies uh, detected incidentally in an asymptomatic woman? So if you detect incidentally a cervical length between 10 to 25 millimeters, what is done is we initiate vaginal progesterone, but we don't leave it at that. Besides that, the cervical length is further monitored every one to two weeks 
until 24 weeks. And what is the point of monitoring the cervical length every one to two weeks is to see if the cervical length goes below this cutoff of 10 millimeters. So if the cervix shortens to below 10 millimeters in a woman who's never had a previous history of preterm birth, say a primary parous woman, then these are the patients in whom cervical cerclage is considered. Also, after the cerclage has been placed for a short cervix, further cervical length measurements are actually not recommended because there is no further therapy which can be undertaken to change the outcome of that pregnancy. So unless you want to see if the cerclage is in place or not, there is no role of measuring cervical length once a cervical cerclage has been placed properly. Now, what happens in case of high-risk women? So we dealt with low-risk women in whom they are primary parents women in whom there was no previous history of preterm. And we decided that if cervical length is between 10 to 25 millimeters, then these are good patients to start on natural vaginal progesterone. And 10 mm is recommended as a cutoff for placing cervical cerclage. But in case of high-risk women who've had previous uh, spontaneous singleton miscarriages or preterm birth, if they've had it early, say between 14 to 27 weeks of gestation, then what is recommended is to consider administering daily vaginal progesterone starting in the early second trimester from 16, continuing up to 36 weeks of gestation. Since they've had an early preterm birth, in this case, we still don't measure the cervical length, say at 12 weeks, but we defer it and measure it at around 14 weeks when there is some degree of development of the lower uterine segment to get an accurate cervical length. However, if there is a woman who's had a preterm birth, say after 28 weeks, then in these women, we start screening for the cervical length by transvaginal ultrasound at 16 weeks, so two weeks later. And from 16 weeks, obviously, we consider giving daily progesterone irrespective of the cervical length in women who are at high risk because they've had a previous preterm birth. Now, if the cervical length is 30 millimeters, that is three centimeters or more, that is reassuring, but we don't leave them like that. What we do is that in this case, we repeat cervical length measurements by transvaginal ultrasound every two weeks until 24 weeks, because remember 24 weeks is that cutoff for initiating preventive measures. And if the, uh, the cervical length remains 30 mm or more till 24 weeks, then we are happy we just continue with the vaginal progesterone. However, if during the course of measurements, we see that the measurement is still not short, but in this borderline area of 26 to 29 millimeters, then we increase the frequency of measurements because now we are more concerned about cervical shortening in these women. And in these women, the cervical length measurement is checked every week until 24 weeks if it remains constant. However, if at any point of time, the cervical length in a high-risk woman is less than 20, is 25 millimeters or less, then because they are high risk, we not only continue the daily vaginal progesterone, but we also consider placing cervical cerclage. So you understand how the management of singleton pregnancy in a low risk woman with a short cervix and a high risk woman, even if she has a normal length cervix, is different from each other. Now, I have not ventured into the domain of multiple pregnancy and short cervix because that is a totally different ball game and you cannot uh, just copy paste the recommendations for a singleton pregnancy on multiple pregnancy. That is probably uh, left for discussion on some other day. Now, this is just to show you a video clip, real time, how cervical incompetence frank cervical incompetence looks like. As you can see here, you can appreciate the fetal foot right in the endocervical canal. And actually, these are the membranes which have herniated completely into the endocervical canal. This is somewhere the internal os, which is fully open, through which the fetus had put its foot into the endocervical canal. And also, you can appreciate presence of this echogenic ball of debris within the amniotic cavity, which is also termed as amniotic sludge. It is believed to be a mixture of fetal vernix, meconium, even blood, pus. And some people consider this as a marker of amniotic infection. However, there are no such guidelines by any uh, society as to how, uh, as to whether you should manage these patients differently, say by giving antibiotics because you suspect amniotic infection. So there is no consensus on how to manage uh, 
patients if you see amniotic sludge, but this is an observation that you might come across when you're assessing patients with cervical incompetence. Now, as I said earlier, we have to take certain care while we are measuring the cervical length, not to exert undue pressure, magnify the image, look at the anatomy carefully, and do a three to five minute assessment because it's a dynamic structure. Now, I'll show you some pitfalls here. And this is a still image showing you a transvaginal image of the cervix. Please remember the orientation dot is here. So this would be the anterior and this is the posterior lip in this case. You would think that this looks like a nice curved cervix. You don't even need to measure it. It is normal in length. But if you look carefully, this is actually, this entire thing is not the cervix. If you see here, well, these look like the anterior and the posterior lip of the cervix. But if you trace this part up, well, the cervical lips are not so thick. I mean, usually they are not so thick. So actually, this part is not the cervical canal, but it's actually part of the lower uterine body. And there is this lower uterine segment contraction here, which has caused or made us think that the cervix is long, which it actually wasn't. As you will see in this clip, this clip is actually of the same patient. And you see how important it is to always assess the cervix real time for some time and not rely on one still image. This is again the same patient. Now here you can see this lower uterine segment contraction. You can appreciate this amniotic cavity. It's bulging into the cervical canal because the internal os is funneling. And this is actually the myometrium of the lower uterine segment. And the true cervical length is actually this. So this was actually a patient with cervical incompetence. Had you not spent time, say three to five minutes to take three measurements and look at the cervix real time, you would have ended up reassuring the patient. By the end of the scan, this was the appearance of the internal loss, almost a U-shaped appearance and see how short the cervix actually was. The external loss was here, the internal loss here. So this was the cervical length. So from this image, we went on to get this image in this patient. So that is the importance of seeing the cervix for three to five minutes in a dynamic manner, real time, and ensure that what you're measuring is not the lower uterine segment. You ensure that by simply following the various anatomical landmarks for the cervical canal. Now, another pitfall, please have a look at this video and see what happens. So this is initially the cervix. I'm sure you can appreciate that this cervix is quite short. This is the short straight cervix. The external loss is here. Please appreciate this is the anterior lip of the cervix. This is the posterior lip of the cervix. I've exerted very gentle transducer pressure here. So this is the external loss. We follow it up. This is nothing but just mucus in the cervical canal. So we are following the endocervical mucosa and the internal loss is somewhere at this level. Now see real time what happens. My probe is in the vagina and now I'm pushing upon the anterior lip of the cervix. So this is what happens when you press upon the cervix undue. And you can see now the cervix, which was so short at that time, is now appearing much longer and curved as well. But the hint which shows you that your pressure is excessive is this thickness. Note how the anterior lip of the cervix is thinner anterior posteriorly as compared to the posterior lip of the cervix. And by one look at this image, I know that the operator has exerted undue pressure on the anterior cervical lip. And so this is an overestimation of the cervical length and not the correct cervical length. So this is to show you how when you exert undue pressure on the cervix, you end up getting a falsely elevated cervical length when actually the cervical length is very less. So this is actually the true cervical length. And here, because I exerted undue pressure, I ended up making the cervix so long. So these two pitfalls, you must keep in mind, don't include the lower uterine segment while measuring the cervical length. Take some time, exert fundal pressure for 15 to 20 seconds if you want to see whether there is internal loss funneling or not. Please don't mistake the cervical mucus for the amniotic fluid look for the amniotic membranes and don't exert undue pressure on the cervix with your ultrasound probe. Now, this is a video clip just to show you how a cervical cerclage looks like on ultrasound real time. And you can appreciate this uh, echogenic suture, which is showing shadowing. 
So this is the cervical stitch in this patient at the level of the internal os. This had been placed transabdominally in this patient. And you can see how the cerclage looks like in the longitudinal and in the transverse plane. So I'm playing the clip again. This is the cerclage, this echogenic ring that you see. Here, this echogenic ring that you see is your cerclage in C2 in the transverse section. And in the sagittal section, it would be seen as a dot. So this is the cerclage in C2 in the sagittal plane. So this these dots that you see, this is the cerclage and there is some shadowing from the cerclage. So this echogenic thing is the cerclage in the longitudinal section, right? You can see the cervical canal quite clearly here again. The cerclage in the transverse section and then the cerclage here in the longitudinal section. And please remember that when we are assessing the cervical cerclage, what we measure is the closed cervical length. So with this, we come to the end of this lecture on cervix. So it's very important and that's why I've stressed that you must familiarize yourself with the normal anatomy of the cervix on transvaginal ultrasound because transvaginal ultrasound is mandatory for assessment of the cervix, be it in gynecology or an obstetric practice. Also, when you're assessing cervix, especially in a gynecological patient, use color Doppler liberally because that can help you in detecting certain isoechoic lesions of the cervix as well because fortunately, most cervical cancers are hypervascular. They show increased vascularity on ultrasound. Uh, cervical cancers, predominantly, they are squamous cell cancers and tend to be hypo, that is more dark than the rest of the cervix on ultrasound. But less commonly, they can have the same echogenicity as the cervix, or rarely they can even be brighter, that is hyperechoic, than the cervix. In fact, there is a short series which has seen that these hyperechoic cervical cancers actually tend to be less aggressive and have a better outcome. Also, when you see a lesion in the cervix, always switch on color Doppler to look for its feeding vessel to determine whether the lesion truly belongs to the cervix or if it is something which is coming up from the uterus into the cervical canal. So to identify the origin of a lesion in the cervix, color Doppler is again very helpful. And please develop your expertise in assessing cervical length. It requires some degree of skill and training because remember the entire management of a patient uh, at risk or even a low risk patient, uh, management of preterm birth depends on how you have measured the cervical length. Thank you.